Joe Arnold, and uh, I'm from a company called uh, SwiftStack, one of the one of the founders here. And today we have a the opportunity to talk about some of the use cases where people are using Swift. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be able to walk through three use cases. We're going to talk about first we're going to talk about Ancestry.com, um, and then we're going to have the opportunity to talk to a couple of other folks. So someone from uh, HP, Mike Gassaway from HPIT, and Scotty Miller from DreamWorks. So it's a pretty cool opportunity. Unfortunately, Jordan couldn't make the summit, unfortunately, and he's asked me to uh, pr present uh, a few of the slides. Um, I'm going to go through and tell the use case and tell the story, and then we'll invite uh, uh, Scotty Miller for DreamWorks and Mike Gasway from HP up on the stage, and uh, we'll talk about what they're doing. So that's the agenda for the, for the next 40 minutes. All right, so to get started, this is a story about how Ancestry has moved away from um, a traditional scale out NAS and started to use object storage and, and the story of, of what they did. And so Jordan pre presented this, so I'm happy to be able to walk through this. So who's familiar with Ancestry.com? I mean, it's a pretty popular web service, right? I know somebody in my family uses it too, and they're always sending me photos and getting me to fill stuff out. And what it does, it allows you to put your genealogy online. And not only can you upload photos and records of you and your family and old photos, but then you can also start to dig through historical records, and they analyze that data and connect the dots. So that's, that's what Ancestry.com does. And it's, it's not just Ancestry.com, but they also have um, a few products that um, other folks might not be aware of. They have like a pure archiving, um, military records, and uh, newspapers, and some of the gene, uh, genealogy stuff. Um, data is a really big part of their business. And they, they collect, and they categorize, and they organize a really a tremendous amount of data. Uh, amount of data. Um, because it's not just about data that people upload into it, but it's also the, the data that they purchase and they, and they collect. They have rooms of these folks that actually will take this, this, uh, these archives that they will purchase, and then they, they'll record them. And so they're kind of carefully you know, making sure that they scan and enter in the data correctly. Um, they have a, a DNA testing product where they will mail you a swab, a tissue swab, and they will uh, sequence that data. And then when you do that with several family members, it'll connect all up. Um, and then do a lot of other media things, TV shows. I don't know if you've seen some of those things. Their storage workflow. So as you can imagine, they have a lot of small file workloads in Ancestry.com. And so that's... Uh, 100K to two megabyte files, so it's getting a high resolution scan of say a, of, a, of, a, of a document from uh, somebody immigrating into, into a country. There's also user uploaded content that they store, and that data, the processed images and the user uploaded, those are, think of that as long tail data that will get requested by users in the application. But then they also have an archive where they keep the original content, the original high resolution raw data of, of, the, of the actual file. So that stores, that's separately stored offline. So what they had was a, a traditional scale out NAS. And when people were building applications, they would connect, they would create a volume and mount that uh, to the server that was receiving, it was serving up that data, and they do that over SIFS, uh, NFS, SMB type of, uh, type of interface. But there were some challenges with that. So cost was one, one big one, uh, because they would buy from, uh, from vendors where you'd have to buy, you, they buy an, an appliance model. And so they were forced to buy when they upgraded from that particular vendor in order to expand the footprint. They didn't have uh, the same type of industry standard APIs. They were serving out HTTP, but then they were talking SIFs or NFS to their storage. Uh, so it's some scaling problems, uh, renewals, licensing, and, and then just the management of having lots of volumes to manage. So they, they, they knew they needed a change, and so the way they executed this change, and we'll hear some of this from, from DreamWorks later on, is they built a bit of middleware that was a, 
a, a service layer between the storage system and the application tier. And that, what that meant was that they could change out the underlying storage system and put new things in and do a, a, a migration over a period of time. And so that was, the, that was the strategy that they took in order to get to object. And so here's some of the, some of the, some of the requirements uh, that, that they wanted to have for their next generation storage. So one was using open source software. They really wanted to use a REST API. Uh, they wanted to minimize vendor lock-in so they could use different vendors if one vendor came along with a different hardware price point. Uh, commodity hardware, and we'll hear more about this later on too. Getting close to the price of a drive is a, a goal that, that, that they had. So when new, new denser drives were available on the market, they could buy those and then put them directly into the system. Uh, they wanted scalability, so they can keep adding and growing the system. Uh, object storage multi-data center, so that way they could, say for an archive tier, put across multiple data centers and uh, keep, things, keep things low cost. Now, they also wanted some of, the, um, some of the performance characteristics from a traditional NAS, so they needed to maintain that performance level, but they still wanted things like snapshots, versioning, and some of the disaster recovery characteristics. So that was sort of their, that was their, their list that they wanted to go through. So they, 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 they took a look at Swift, and the thing with Swift is it's a, uh, they were going for the a high, high availability, distributed across uh, multiple data centers and um, across multiple nodes rather than a, a RAID model. And they were, they had, uh, they were okay with an eventually consistent model, um, which means that when they put data into the system, they're gonna be putting in new objects. And when they go retrieve that object, um, they're not trying to say distribute a lock around it. Now, the, an eventually consistent storage system is not necessarily gonna be good for running databases or running operating systems, but it's perfect for storing, uh, storing these documents and these images and then serving them out over, over the internet. So it just matched the use case really well. Uh, they chose to, to store with uh, three replicas and um, one of the things that they did notice, they were very interested in OpenStack, but they wanted to start with storage and they could implement Swift without necessarily bringing up a whole OpenStack environment, and that allowed them to tackle uh, just the storage problem first before they moved on and worked on the rest of their, their, com their uh, compute problems. So a few components, and we'll, what we'll do is we're gonna walk through uh, a few of the components in Swift, and we're gonna map that to some of the hardware that they decided to purchase, so we can get a, get a flavor for what that hardware does. So the roles in a, in a Swift cluster there, there's a, a proxy server, and that's on the, the, the front end. It receives the incoming storage requests, and if it, it routes the requests to the appropriate storage, the, the containers, uh, the, uh, the object storage nodes. Then there's the account and container server, and what that does is it keeps track of uh, what objects are grouped together. Now, not from a, not from a per request per basis, but when you list objects and you want to uh, organize them, that's what the account cont and container server are used for. And, uh, and so you have accounts that point to containers and containers that point to object, and that record keeping is used uh, not to service requests, but so you could do things like list what objects are, are in a container, what account has uh, which containers in them. So it's a grouping function. Uh, and then we have the object servers themselves, and they actually store the data. Then there's a data structure in, in Swift called the, called the ring, and what that does is it, it takes a URL, and we heard Chris talk about this early in one of his sessions, it takes that URL and it maps it down to physical locations on the, the object server. And uh, there's, a, there's a ring for each container and objects, and um, that's what gives Swift its ability to uh, add and grow capacity. You make modifications to that ring, you distribute that out to the cluster, you add additional hardware, you make modifications to the ring and you distribute it out. So that's the strategy for, for scaling out the environment. Um, there's uh, multiple regions that, uh, that they, they wanted to take advantage of, and that gave them 
the ability to just deploy a single storage server in two data centers. And if one of those data centers, say, were to entirely go offline, they would still have one up and operational. And this is, you'll see this why this is important later on in some of, the, some of the benchmarking. So in their use case, they wanted to make sure that they could survive a full data center outage and still have a, an operating website. So they, they, they reached out to us um, and uh, enlisted us to use our, um, our, our, our product around OpenStack Swift. So um, we've, we've been working really hard in the Swift community. We have uh, the project technical lead, so uh, SwiftStack uh, is, does a lot of development in, in the Swift community. It's a broad ecosystem, a lot of participants in that community. And uh, what we've done is we've built a, a, a product to uh, make it easy to deploy, operate, and, and scale a, a, Swift, a Swift cluster. So that's what we do. And this is a screenshot of, of, of that product. And really what that allowed them to do was instead of having to get ramped up and be Swift experts themselves, they could use a, um, a tool to do uh, a lot of the management of the Swift environment for them. So the hardware. So the, the nodes that they decided to pick were, um, uh, they got these, these from Redapt, which is a partner that we work with, and they're fairly dense storage nodes. There's a, uh, storage head, and then there's an 84 SAS hard drives. And this is, this is a, a bit more power than what we typically see for people who are doing an archival use case. And if you think about this use case, what they're doing isn't um, necessarily archiving data. Um, they are serving data, long tail assets, out to users. So there's a lot of performance in, uh, in, the, in these systems. The account container, there's, which has some of that metadata, we are using, uh, there's an SSD tier to cache some of that data, so we could ingest all of those archives and those uploads that they're receiving from their end users, and this allows us to keep track of them um, and give, give good, good performance on that. And then the proxy nodes. Now, uh, these are just a, you know, one U, uh, one U server, and uh, 10 gigabit in and out of in and out of the rack, and so those, that's is the, the the hardware that they that they set up, and this is the this is the this the the hardware rack for the that's serving out a lot of the the, the, the data. This is one of them. So when they want went to go benchmark, they uh, the the nutshell is it was three times what they needed. Uh, to sustain for their production workload. And uh, what they did was they, they ran benchmark, and we have, have very good testing tools so we could profile the workload that they, that they needed in order to ser service their application, which was a mix of reads and writes. So there's a, they did a couple of tests, one with a 10% write ratio to read ratio, and 5% and 95%, and it met the expectations that they that they needed, three times, in fact. So we're really happy with the performance of the Swift, Swift environment. And so really what this means is they could take, they could take standard off-the-shelf equipment, apply software onto it, and exceed the performance that they were getting out of their traditional NAS for this, for this use case, which was long tail storing and serving uh, image assets for Ancestry.com. It's pretty cool. We're really happy with, with these results. Um, so next steps with them uh, is to handle the, the, the backup. So we've done a, a Commvault integration so where you can take Commvault, Simpana, and those will be backed up into, uh, into Swift. So that's a project they want to take on. Uh, Swift storage policies. This is the ability to carve out different pools of infrastructure for different, uh, different use cases. And they can do things like have reduced redundancy, or for the archive tier, when they want to be extra careful, they can have, say, a more sophisticated erasure coding scheme in there. Um, and there is some use cases where they want to have even more performance on uh, highly, 
very popular content, that can be put on an, an SSD tier. Now, when they take on their OpenStack uh, project, the Swift cluster will be the backup storage for Glance and some of the Docker images that they're gonna be storing in there. And that is it. That's the use case that Ancestry.com is using with Swift. So uh, thanks for listing that. I'd like to invite uh, Mike Gasaway from HP up here and Scotty Miller from DreamWorks. Go to mind. Welcome them. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. All right, so this, this session's all about, about use cases. And uh, Scott, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, explain, just introduce yourself and explain uh, you know, what your role is at DreamWorks and what is the need for object storage uh, for you within DreamWorks. Sure, uh, my name's Scotty Miller. I'm a technologist in the technology operations group. I focus primarily on our HPC environment, uh, storage, asset preservation, editorial, post-production. Uh, our need is similar to Ancestry, a typical animated movie for us. You get a 90-minute movie, it's 130,000 individual frames at 48 hertz. It takes about 500 million files to create that final movie product. We uh, complete two movies a year, so about a, a billion new files a year that we want to preserve forever potentially monetize, use for sequels, use for TV programs, use for consumer products. Uh, we've been doing all this work on traditional scale-out NAS products, and a couple of factors have come into play. The cost of traditional scale-out NAS is much higher than the object store, as Joe mentioned. For us, though, we're also faced with the desire to collaborate globally. So we're using object stores in two places. One is in the global collaboration, and we've actually been doing that for almost three years now. We started with HP's public cloud using Swift and some various gateway products to share data sets between our US and India operations. Um, that gave us experience with Swift as an API, got us comfortable to the notion of eventual consistency. You can't, you have to educate your developers, right? One of the things you have to think about in your use cases is people who are used to uh, traditional file service, atomic sort of operations and locking, they're gonna have a little bit of an education. Uh, one of the things that's interesting in a public cloud implementation of Swift is that eventual consistency window can be minutes long. So we had to learn how to deal with that. But, so that use case is collaboration, and the other use case for us is asset preservation. Very much like Ancestry, most of our data set is cold, long tail, write once, maybe read once, but it has value. And if you can preserve that data and reuse it in the future and make revenue, then it's an asset. If it costs you more to keep it, or you can't find it and you can't monetize it, then it's a liability. It doesn't make sense to pay to keep liabilities around. Our other use case is a little bit non-traditional for Swift. Uh, the intent is to use it as a replacement for a tier one performance scale out NAS in our uh, computational rendering environment. Uh, the intent there is replace our asset management system, which has been database backed, file system based, with one that's database backed but Swift based. By uh, we built a middleware piece, similar to what Ancestry did, that all of our applications can talk to. It's an asset management middleware, not necessarily a storage middleware, but it provided a place to do storage location transparency, to do storage protocol type transparency, and provide an access gateway that the applications can say, I just need to get the Shrek model, and that it's in Swift, or that it's in Swift that originated in Bangalore, doesn't matter. So um, long-term asset preservation is the first use case, uh, cheap and durable, and then Tier one and a half storage, I guess you call it, is um, the other use case where we're trying to replace primary NAS with Swift. Uh, so thanks, Scott. So, Mike, um, so what are the what are the challenges that you were facing inside of of HP to serve uh, internal assets, and uh, and and what, what did you come across as solutions uh, for using with using Swift? Um, our primary use case for Swift it was similar to to Ancestry in the way that. Um, I work primarily on the storage team, and we were looking for a cloud-based storage solution um, for a specific use case of uh, sync and share for all of our uh, end users within HP. And so, you know, we didn't need the full OpenStack architecture at that time, so we just brought up um, Swift, and what we were looking for was something that would be easy to manage, short on people, you know, the story. Um, and so that's when we turned to Swift Stack for that particular need. Um, pushing out Swift and then eventually developing the app for 
for the sync and share service uh, that is now pushed out to all of HP. Yeah, so t t to share a little bit about um, dealing with, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of employees at HP. Yep. Um, and so what, was a, what, kind of, what did you pick up in order to be able to serve out all, all of those users and support all those users? Like on the authentication side. Oh, so on the, we use LDAP for authentication. Um, and one of the things, uh, or one of the components that we needed from Swift was to be able to use LDAP authentication in that. And um, in that process, um, we worked with Swift Stack to uh, get that development into the, into the Swift Stack product so that we could tie it into our LDAP infrastructure. Um, and then, would you share a little bit about the product that you selected for for files you can share? Because I think that's another cool use yeah, case that, the, from an internal That IT product uh, is actually a product from GladNet that we rebranded under. Uh, it's called HP Data Drive, and um, it, that product um, has an agent that runs on everybody's desktop and will sync and share to their mobile devices, laptops, Macs. It doesn't matter what they use, and stores the data in their quota, 25 gigabyte quota on, on the object store. Cool, cool. Um, so can you walk a little bit, so uh, Scott, walk a little bit through the, that, that animation use case. So what, is the, what are the steps involved, right? You have the, you have the, the models that You're are- You're stealing my thunder from my Thursday's talk. <laughs> oh, your Thursday's talk. Yeah. But we well, give a hint, yeah. give a hint. Sure, I think so, it's interesting. Um, it, it is an interesting process. Most people don't realize the before I go there, I wanted to do, do another plug for Swift Stack Middleware. One, one of our requirements for our uh, asset management system was the ability to have object immutability, which is something that's not in native Swift. Mm -hmm. the, the, when we had a lot of talks about what did immutability mean in an eventually consistent environment where you have multiple writers around the globe. And we ended up uh, with Swift Stack working out an engineering spec to build a delegated authorization middleware piece that for certain objects in certain marked containers with certain headers in the put command will call out to an authentication server that we provide that will decide whether or not that object could be written, deleted, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Huge. Getting that, and that was about three weeks worth of engineering work, and we had ship delivered software. That would have been two years with a traditional NAS vendor. It's the, it's the joy of open source is that you can talk to people, they agree it's a good idea, and you get it done. Um, a big win for us. Uh, the animation process is, it's a three to five year process per film, and it starts out with, hey, I have a good idea, let's make a movie about an ogre to release date. Uh, in the first two years or so, it's primarily developing models, developing the look of the characters, figuring out what the story looks like and what the environment looks like. Very small compute demand, very small but very critical storage demand. Uh, we're, we're, at that time, we're creating storyboards, which are hand-drawn, rough drafts of the movie, if you will, that people want to play back with synced audio. Mm -hmm. um, we iterate on that for quite a long time. There's a, there's a famous quote by Da Vinci that says, art is never complete, it's only abandoned. Uh, George Lucas says, movies are never finished, only released. So it's an artistic endeavor, much like software development. There's always one more fix or one more tweak or one more thing you want to change. Uh, there's a name for it, but I can't say it in play company. The, uh, so we iterate up until about the last 12 to 16 months of the movie, and then we turn the knob up to high resolution, 2K, full color fidelity, left eye, right eye stereoscopic, and then that's when the compute kicks in. A typical movie consumes 80 to 100 million CPU hours of compute, um, hmm. generates, as I mentioned, 250,000 250, final frames of movie, plus the, 100, or the 50, 500 million or so intermediate files that are both the source code and the work by products that make in the film. Add to that, you have to dub into 45 different languages and do any text in the film in those native languages and you get quite a few combinatorics. So all this stuff is right once valuable data set, which is why the object store makes sense for both that middleware asset management, the final frames as they're delivered, and then the preservation footprint we keep forever. Cool. You know, I also wanted to make a comment about working with the open source community because there was a, a need that we had as well. So. Since the time that we've pushed out Swift, we've also pushed out HP Helion, mm -hmm. um, integrated that into our Swift that cluster, that. Yeah. and uh, you know we had a need for the V3 support, and you know we came to to your company, and within a week we had that support or that fix back. It was amazing. V3 for Keystone? Yeah. Oh, good. 
Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and then what's the use case? So then, what are you? Uh, what What are the use cases that you're integrating Helion and the, and the Swift environment? So how are you seeing those that integration um, work? Well, that integration allowed us to do LDAP full LDAP support through Keystone into into Swift, um, allowing you know complete access through the through the uh, through Helion um, into Swift and and back again. Back again. Um, yeah. All right. So what what do you? What's the future of uh, what are the, some of the next projects that you're planning on taking on uh, with an HPIT to use, right? So you have the storage system. You're not just using it for one thing. Now you're using it for both files you can share, yep. and it's backing up it's, a, an OpenStack uh, yep. cl Swift cluster. What, what's, what's next? So, of course, we, we store all of our Glance images in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll also be using it to back up, uh, you know, tenant images when they want to use that function. So that'll be probably the biggest next use case is, is backup. Um, image backup. Can I get an idea? Just like the, uh, not necessarily scale. If you don't want to want to share that, but what type of hardware that you guys are have, have chosen to, to to run run the system on? Sure. Um, we run obviously HP hardware. Um, <laughs> Although, H, it's HP DL 380s uh, on the proxy front end with uh, with SSD, and then we run uh, DL 380s with a. Uh, with a JBOD very similar to Ancestry's. Mm -hmm. um, we run a two node header with, and that's split between the two, uh, I'm sorry, between the, uh, the JBOD on the back end. Um, so each node basically has 45 disks uh, assigned to it. Um, uh, what, kind of, what kind of time does it take to operate the, the cluster for you on a kind of on, on an ongoing basis? Ongoing basis, um, it's extremely stable. For us, um, and I wish there were some wood I could knock on, just because <laughs> you know how that works. But uh, extremely stable, ongoing. We're probably about maybe half an FTE. Okay. So, uh, what kind of yeah. hardware are you guys, are you guys selecting? Uh, similar. The the proxy nodes, the account container nodes, are DL three sixties and three eighties. We're mm -hmm. also an HP hardware shop. Our storage nodes are SL forty five forties, which are an HP product that has uh, one, two, or three controllers in either sixty, fifty, or twenty five sorry, 60, 50, or 15 drives per. We're using the 60 drive, one controller base. We have uh, eight of them in California and two different fire zones to make two regions, and then a set of them in Bangalore, India, to be the third region. Right, right on, right on. And we are spread site to site as well. So we actually have three different storage policies that we use. Um, depending on if it's a single site application, then they can fall into mm -hmm. one of the two sites, and then our, we have a site to site, which is a four replica policy. That's awesome. Uh, any questions from anybody on the in, in the audience that would like to ask any questions from these from these folks? Really? <laughs> Don't feel bad. <laughs> well, no, you I've been asking questions. Go to OpenStack to learn stuff. You gotta ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I appreciate everyone uh, everyone coming in and listening to a couple some of these use cases. Hope you found it informative, and let's give a, let's thank uh, uh, Mike and Scotty for sharing. With us. Thanks so much.